My name is Mary Prado, and I'm the Managing Director here of the Northern Trust Key Biscayne office. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you here for in being our wonderful guests this evening. And before the program starts, I want to make sure to introduce those Northern Trust partners who are here hosting with me tonight. Annie Nunez, Senior Vice President in Charge of Private Client Services for Dade County. Annie is somewhere over in the corner. Uh, Michael Aleman is our investment consultant. Relationship managers Nydia Rundle and Irene Rodriguez. Uh, Mabel Mesa is in charge of our client services. And our tellers, which hopefully all of you know and love, uh, Janetta Kell and Nora Morales. At the same time, I'd like to take a moment and recognize um, our village government officials. We have um, Morton Freed. There's Morton Freed. No further introductions are, are needed for Mort. Um, Mayor Frank Kaplan. Former Mayor Bob Vernon. Councilman Michael Davey, Jim Tainter, and Myra Lindsay. My colleagues and I would like to take this moment to once again say I hope you enjoy the presentation and we look forward to personally meeting and sharing with each and every one of you Northern's experience in helping create legacies. Thank you and enjoy the evening. At this time, I will present the Heritage Society, President Robert Bristol. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, she just notified me that uh, she overlooked Betty Sim Conroy. Uh, one of the, there she is back there. Uh, somebody who was also very involved in the incorporation, which we're celebrating 20 years. Uh, this weekend. Pardon me? Oh. <clears throat> I'm Bob Bristol, president of the Key Biscayne Historical and Heritage <laughs> Society. We are honored with the presence of several of the Matheson family and many of Key Biscayne's significant residents. The Key Biscayne Historical and Heritage <laughs> Society is happy to present to you tonight a historically educational lecture about a very important person for Key Biscayne and Dade County. His name is William John Matheson, also known as Commodore Matheson. The more you know of this fascinating individual, you will appreciate the legacy he has left for us. He was a very successful businessman who had a love for the sea and the environment. Tonight, Joan Gill Blank will give the main presentation. Uh, Joan's book, Key Biscayne, is a comprehensive history of our island paradise. A resident of Key Biscayne since 1951, Joan has authored or edited numerous books and articles on Florida's cultural, historical, and ecological heritage, including Born of the Sun, the official bicentennial history book of the state of Florida. Uh, we are honored to hear her speak tonight. Joan? I can see everyone, and you can see me, but can you hear me? That's the big question. All right, thank you, Bob. That was a very nice introduction, and it's good to know that so many very significant others are here. I'm glad to be here. I'm gonna get a little arranged here. See, somebody left their glasses. Oh, here, they can put them in here. Now this is gonna be a little tricky for me to get organized here for a minute. We had hoped that I was going to have a normal uh, stand, 
but it didn't happen. <laughs> I don't know if this is a music stand, but I promise I won't sing. <laughs> While you're waiting, while you're waiting, um, I just wonder if on your way here, did some of you catch a glimpse in the village green of the tall, good-looking man dressed in plantation whites and sporting a Panama hat, its brim turned up at a jaunty angle? His eyes sparkled with mischief when he slipped me a message, and then, poof, he was gone. When the Historical Foundation uh, was started, I told them that they should do good things, but in the process, while they should be serious, they should have fun. So I think we're going to try that out tonight. We are. Good. OK, so you can just pull that whole batch out. And I will, con I will continue in a minute. You can just hold it, but don't open it quite yet. So, as I said, his eyes sparkled with mischief when he slipped me a message, and then poof, he was gone. I was immediately struck by his remarkable likeness to the late Dr. William John Matheson, who in the beginning of the 20th century owned much of this island, turning it into a coconut plantation and a tropical plant garden. The message he gave me said, I am pleased all of you are celebrating my legacy tonight, but please make certain to put the Key Biscayne creation myth at rest. Thanks, WJM. <laughs> I was glad to have his concurrence that we might put to rest the oft-told scripture. You recall it. And verily, it came to pass that on arrival on Key Biscayne, W.J. Matheson upon the crest of the seventh wave, and in the light of the rising moon, lay down on the soft sand and slept. <laughs> and when he awakened refreshed, he said, this is my island, but it is bereft of great tropical beauty. And so he issued one command, let there be palm trees thousands and thousands of palm trees. And there were palm trees, small sprouts and tall trees. And W.J. rose up and said, let this land be fruitful. And lo, flowering trees and fruit came forth. And so the story goes, single-handedly, he created the island paradise on Earth, and it was good. <laughs> I realize full well that he is listening to us from his celestial 4S, a recent gift from his new friend, Steve Jobs. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to keep the spirit of his message and simply introduce you to a beloved and generous man, W.J. Matheson, who was born in 1856 and for 72 years lived a very full life. Can I give you that picture? <laughs> All right, if you can just hold it up. This is the photograph of W.J. that I like. And that's kind of the man I saw in the Village Green. So if you're looking on your way back, <laughs> you'll know who to look for. OK. When W.J. died, it was at the helm of his yacht, the Seaforth, a mile offshore from Key Biscayne, returning with friends he had taken cruising, as was his style. He was described as a man of, quote, joy, ebullience, and zest, who loved to share his pleasures and high spirits with others. Who was he? In the 1920s, one writer declared, he is one of the most interesting men in America. I wish he would write an autobiography. And David Fairchild, who knew the Mathesons well and was a beneficiary of their South Florida coconut and other tropical plant introductions, wrote in a scholarly paper, a book could be written about Matheson's Island. 
So what else do we know about W.J.? He was an in, <laughs> he was an in charge kind of a guy, always taking a leadership role and active interest. W.J. was happiest at the helm of his boat or the joystick of his plane, or sitting at the head of a corporate boardroom, perched at a chemistry bench, sitting in the Oval Office of a U.S. president, or signing a check to present to a major research firm, foundation. Or, listen up, writing his name with a flourish to seal a contract quote, on a certain tract of land, I don't have four hands. <laughs> on a certain tract of land, whoops, wrong page. A certain tract of land 5,680 feet north of a certain coconut tree close to the Cape Florida Lighthouse. Do any of you have contracts these days that read like that? <laughs> yes. This was the first of several Key Biscayne parcels running from beach to bay, bought during the early days of the 20th century until W.J. held 1,700 acres, more or less, of the sand island that became part of the Matheson family identity, passed from W.J. to his son, Hugh, son, Malcolm, and daughter Anna, and their children, Hardy, Bill, Finley L, and Hugh. How'd I do? And six or seven, maybe eight generations more. Descendants Finley B and Bruce, asleep down there at his helm, <laughs> <laughs> are with us tonight to celebrate the ongoing legacy. Perhaps later they'll tell us the right generational numbers, six, seven, eight. Five, six, at least six. A quarter of a century before W.J. began to change the island's destiny, he figuratively and literally made an enormous change, affecting his future fortunes and that of the textile and dye industries. Call it a huge splash of color. It was in the 1880s he founded William J. Matheson and Company to become the U.S. agent based in New York for the German chemical and dye giant, Leopold Casella. Later, he founded the National Aniline and Chemical Company, as well as the Allied Chemical Corporation, both of the New York Stock Exchange, which became so successful at manufacturing and distribu distribution of synthetic dyes that the textile industry, previously dependent on vegetable-based dyes, as were many other industries of the day, was revolutionized. Matheson, sh <laughs> Matheson shot to the top of corporate America through his innovative work and leadership. His reputation spread from Wall Street to Fleet Street and beyond. W.J. found himself an American capitalist and consultant in global business affairs. The Mathesons kept an historic estate known as Fort Hill near Huntington, Long Island. W.J. restored it and rehabilitated its fine gardens and grounds. Today it is listed on the National Registry and dates back to the days of the Revolutionary War. Its adjoining forests of ancient oaks and woodlands known as Matheson's Meadow, uh, a gift to the Nature Conservancy, remains in its natural state for the public's enjoyment. Speaking of legacies. Matheson arrived in South Florida when nearly everything was still in its natural state. Urged to visit the area by his young son who was in school at Ransom in Coconut Grove, he was struck by its mainly unpopulated, undisturbed tropical beauty, its frontier spirit, its less hurried lifestyle. W.J. bought land and built a winter home in the Grove, considered a retirement, something that didn't really happen. I mean, what do you do if the president recalls you, the president of the United States, recalls you to Washington for your extra expertise as a business consultant 
and that's what happened in the First World War. In Florida, he was enchanted by the climate, the subtropics, the tropical colors, the gin clear water, the fishes, the birds and tropical ecology, the plants, jungles, and glades. He helped encourage the Everglades as a park, but that's another story. He loved the ancient hammocks. He bought one on the bay, guarded it from development for many years before donating it to the fledgling Dade County Park System in the 1920s. It was named Matheson Hammock. I think some of you probably know it, or most of you. <laughs> From the day in 1902 when he first sailed into Biscayne Bay, he admired the old Cape Florida lighthouse where there were groves of coconut and date trees surrounding a two-story cottage. He learned it was occupied by the heirs of the first American royal land grant holder, Mary Ann Davis, and the property had been held by the Davis family since the 1820s before the lighthouse was built. The family now occupied the premises. Uh, probably to W.J.'s chagrin, the cape was not for sale. <laughs> well, W.J. could have bought any island in the world, but he had his mind set on a South Sea island in the Atlantic, easily accessible. He had a busy, busy life. By 1908, he had found available Key Biscayne property of the Cape uh, north of the Cape Florida tract. He quietly acquired the tracks, running from beach to bay, from ridges to swales, woodlands to wetlands. He took time out between other commitments and began to plan his latest challenge. He began with simple planting of test limes and mangoes, but was dissatisfied with their lack of promise on the sand island. He began to seriously design and plan a kind of visionary island, the kind of romantic tropical fantasy island he'd seen in the South Pacific. And increasingly, he liked the idea of planting a coconut plantation, not only for the natural beauty, but for the commercial possibility of competing with the South Sea's copra trade. He did not know that this coconut plantation that became the largest in the continental United States some years later, would become a very special legacy. He put his son Hugh, a science major at Yale, class of 1911, in charge. W.J. laid out plans. Hugh and the superintendent acted. They hired workers to prepare the land for planting and building in certain areas for dredging and filling. From mainland headquarters on the Miami River, their private work boats ran on regular schedules. There was a black community and a white community, because you must remember those were the days when things were still sub segregated. Bahamian workers sailed over across the Gulf Stream to live and work. There were trained gardeners, a beekeeper, a carpenter, probably several, mechanics, and so forth. They dug wells, put up windmills, a water tank, a commissary, a school. Life revolved around the big barn that was on Crandon and actually is on the premises of what is now the Ritz. Today we might call it, in the old days, enviably green. Most of the architectural structures built and now sadly destroyed or vanished because of hurricanes, erosion, dynamite, and bulldozers were designed for housing or agricultural purposes. WJ's architectural legacy is very special and you should see the Mashta House show at the community center. Photos courtesy of Finley B. Uh, and the uh, put together by the Art and Public Places and curated by Cesar Trosabaris, and I put my hand in too. Masha House was the Key Biscayne answer to the Hamptons, an entertainment mecca and safe landing for yachts when the Mathesons hosted parties or gatherings for Manhattan boardroom colleagues. Like the Mellons, Carnegies, and Vanderbilts and the elite of Miami to officially open the Miami winter social season. Besides the roll call of industrials, 
no, of industrialists who came by for endless sunsets and sundowners at Mashta House. Important plant explorers, botanists, and ecologists from around the world came to study and see for themselves the successful experiments and ongoing introductions of economic and landscape plants, the serious side of this botanical garden paradise that was being created on the quay. Fortunately, their contributions are documented by the eminent botanist and naturalist David Fairchild as head of foreign plant introduction for the United States who records details from many boat trips to the Hacienda Harbor docks en route to the nursery, our village green, with its introductory screen sheds and its well-fitted lath house. Hugh worked tirelessly. He also took the brunt of the restoration after the disastrous hurricane of 1926, when many rare plants were shredded or compromised, including the baobab tree, which he nurtured back to health. You can see this historic and sacred tree of Africa by way of, came, it came by way of Cuba uh, on the Heritage Trail as one of our two monumental trees planted in 1917. They barely survived the storm. They are marked on our Heritage Trail as witness trees. We might call them tonight legacy trees the first in the USA. Fairchild was grateful to W.J., quote, making his unusual facilities available to us. He and Hugh were delighted, said Fairchild, to take on a new role in the scientific development of tropical agriculture in America and to show how the successful ones prospered on the sandy soil of this island. The Mathesons purposely, <laughs> let me try that word again. The Mathesons purposely selected some wildlife habitat to remain undisturbed around the cultivated areas. Today, in spite of subsequent massive clearing, dredging, filling, and construction in modern Key Biscayne, um, Protected native plant remnants along our shorelines stand testimony to the ancient mangrove forests so necessary to the health and safety of barrier islands. And one primeval maritime forest in Crandon Park still grows under the watchful eye of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Biscayne Nature Center. Tonight, as we celebrate together, may we wish for the continued stewardship of our environmentally sensitive island, the continuing planting and propagation of coconut and plant and palm and other trees, vigilant attention to nourishment and critical management of our ever-moving sand beaches and foundations, and a quiet end to this rainy, windy hurricane season. <laughs> but finally, but finally, <laughs> let me say that the 1,700 acres described as lying 5,680 feet from a certain coconut tree near the lighthouse became, as you know, the sites, respectively, of the village of Key Biscayne and of Crandon Park. It is appropriate tonight that we celebrate the legacy of W.J. Matheson and his heirs who all told have bequeathed wondrous gifts of public parklands to the people of Florida, which Bruce will tell you about. The special gift we know best, one, the special and the special gift we know best, one very fine custom designed island paradise known also as zip code 33149. <laughs> Thank you, and now may I turn the microphone over to Bob and try to slip out of this chair, <laughs> not to my knees. Uh, okay.
Thank you, Joan. Now we know about what Commodore Matheson did for Key Biscayne. We are honored tonight to also have Bruce Matheson, great-grandson of Commodore Matheson, who represents the Matheson family on matters of Cranon Park. He will give us information about land donations to Dade County. The donations of land for Matheson Hammock and Cranon Park were two of the largest donations to the Dade County Park System. Bruce? Mary, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, set the record straight. Um, <clears throat> what we have here is, is a great uh, organization. Bobby Bristol and his crew founded it. He's responsible for the shirt I'm wearing. And so... And his is to clean. Not Friday. I don't know how I could possibly follow Joan Gilblank because she embellished so much of the family history that I can't touch it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joan. That was a great job. I will tell you two, two uh, brief uh, anecdotes about how Matheson Hammett got to become a park, the first park in Dade County, and Crandon Park. There was a gentleman who was hired by Charlie Crandon, who was a commissioner from 1920 to 1940, a county commissioner. He hired A.D. Doug Barnes from the city of Miami to head the Parks Department. At that time, there were only three employees in the Parks Department total. And one of the first things they did was put the banyan trees down the old trolley track that ran from Car Gables Miracle Mile into downtown. The second thing he did in, in major efforts was to create a park for Dade County. Dade County had no parks until 1930. Doug Barnes was a very perceptive gentleman. He arranged to have the winter meeting of the national directors of, of state uh, and national parks here in Miami. And that was in December. And they happened to have a field trip to Matheson Hammond. Later, and, and of course he said, wouldn't this be great for a park? That was the 80 acres on the west side of Old Cutler Road. There were about six acres on the east side, but the majority was on the west side. That was property my great-grandfather owned and had actually sold for development, but he bought it back and donated it to the county in May of 1930, Dade County's first park. It was A.D. Doug Barnes who accompanied the state agricultural inspector over here to Key Cane to inspect the nursery. Now, Doug Barnes and the state nursery inspector were good friends, and so Doug got to come over to the island and he got the tour courtesy of the state plant inspector. At that time, he was also talking to Charlie Crandon about the prospects of wouldn't it be nice if part of Kibis Cane couldn't become a public park? Because at that time, they had no beach for a park in Dade County. So what happened is Charlie Crandon talked to my grandfather and said, wouldn't it be nice if you would donate half of your land to the county for a park and we will build you a causeway. Well, it didn't go over too well, but he thought about it. And he, with his younger brother, Malcolm, and his older sister, Nan Wood, they decided in 1940 to donate the 975 acres, which is now Cranon Park. At that time, the county had the property where the Seaquarium is, and they had no way to get to it. The city of Miami had the land on Virginia Key. They had no way to get to it. And the Deering Estate owned the, what is now the State Park, 410 acres on the south end of the island. They had no way to get to it. So the causeway benefited four different entities. Now that's about as much as I can tell you because my cousin Finley here has some really interesting anecdotes about the, <laughs> about the menagerie that my great-grandfather had. And for the record, it's six generations. Well, 
Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, I actually wasn't supposed to say anything because usually one Matheson is enough in an evening. <laughs> but um, there were a lot of animals on, on the island, and uh, as Bruce alluded to, on some of the maps, there's a, a little island. It's called um, Flamingo Island. And I guess our grandfather went to, the, uh, to Cuba, I think, and got these flamingos. And well, some came from Andros, but the real pink ones came from Cuba. And in any event, he thought that the uh, flamingos would stay on the island because they need a, a certain amount of runway in order to, be t to take off and fly. Well, it didn't take these uh, flamingos very long to figure out that they could run in circles and get the speed, and they took off and left. So Flamingo Island didn't actually have any flamingos anymore. And then it was uh, W.J. Matheson that actually had a, a monkey on the island. Um, um, and as the story goes, uh, the monkey was only friendly to W.J. <laughs> and my father tells the story about uh, the monkey getting on board his boat and opening up a toolbox and throwing all his tools overboard. <laughs> now, I suppose there's part of the story that has a little Darwinian theory. I think that monkey was one of our cousins, Bruce. <laughs> but I'm not saying which one. But I wasn't supposed to say anything tonight, but if, if you look at the photographs that the, uh, Bobby Bristol has, and you see the magnitude of the construction and the effort that was put into this island, that was planting the trees, digging the canals, and driving pilings, it's incredible. And then to have it all knocked down by hurricanes and start all over again. And W.J. Matheson suffered from a, a rare form of encephalitis. And it robbed him of his energy. And in the last few years of his life, he experimented trying to get drugs and different doctors to help him. And uh, uh, Frank Doubleday of the publishing fame also had the same disease. And where this guy got the energy to continue on with this, because he could only work a couple hours a day, and then he'd have to take a nap. And part of the reason why he liked cruising is he always felt better on a boat and always felt better afterwards. Well, um, so much for the monkey, Bruce, and we'll find out <laughs> which one it is. Thank you very much, Finley. You know, when I uh, approached Finley uh, several months ago about this presentation and asked him to uh, hopefully speak at it, uh, he said one Matheson is enough to speak <laughs> at it. So uh, I'm very happy that you uh, got up and said a few words. Okay, um, I don't know. I was going to offer a question and answer period if anybody has any. Uh, particularly pressing questions. Uh, maybe it's better off if you just uh, uh, attack Joan or Bruce or Finley after the meeting. Um, Bob Maggs? Where's Bob? Oh, here he is. Bob Maggs would like to say a few words now, and uh, I'm, I'm done. Thank you, Bob. I feel like the caboose on the train. <laughs> the last speaker, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful meeting. And all of the things that we've heard, not only from Joan, but the Mathesons and everybody, Bob, <clears throat> has been a wonderful tour through the past from many, many years back until right up to the present time. I want to say thank you particularly to the Northern Bank uh, for their hospitality and all of the work that they put in. They did a tremendous amount of work. Ann Nunez over there, Mary Prado, Diane Cruz, and all of them. Uh, let me tell you how grateful we are, not only as a society, but as a community for what you do here on the key for us. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I have to say, say thank you also to Joan. Joan Gilblank. That was a wonderful presentation. Yay! 
We all appreciate that that didn't just happen easily, and I think it took many hours of work to put that together. And we recognize that, and we are grateful to you for that. <sighs> Finley, you're great. <laughs> Your stories were wonderful. Bruce, you're magnificent also. I don't know what we would do without the two of you on the key, and it's just wonderful to have you over here and you over here sitting together in one evening. <laughs> it is just fine. Um, let, I don't mean to forget anybody. We have a wonderful society. As you all know, we're just about four years old. Uh, which isn't a very old society, but we are the largest society on Key Biscayne. Uh, we <laughs> in this short period of time, we've moved up to somewhere around 240 or 250 members, and I think that rates quite highly. It started really when Ed Meyer and I had a little disagreement as to whether anybody would be interested in hysterical, historical things. <laughs> Um, and we decided we better consult with Bob Bristol there. We came over and sat in front of his shop two or three times a week, beginning about September through till December, writing up all kinds of wonderful things, most of which we've ignored, like the bylaws. <laughs> you know, only two or three years in a position at any one time. We don't. But in any event, uh, I do want to thank Ed Meyer, although Ed isn't here, and of course, Bob Bristol. Bob Bristol has been our president, and we've been well blessed in having him. Uh, what he knows in his little finger is probably far more uh, than most of us carry around in our entire bodies. And the amount of time that he puts in preparing the pictures and the displays and helping us collect all this material that not only takes up a large portion of his camera shop, but also is included over there in the storage room in the Plaza building. Uh, it's now becoming really voluminous and very impressive. I hope someday we have a place to show it to everybody. Of course, we call it a museum. <laughs> and maybe with the help of our, some, our good politicians and others, <clears throat> We'll, we'll find a little 30 by 30 feet piece of land in which we can do this. So on behalf of all the members of the society, I thank you all for coming. On behalf of all of those that I've mentioned that have made this a wonderful, wonderful evening, um, I want to thank you once again as a group. We'll look forward to many more of these affairs, and I know as we go through the years ahead, there will be many more. Thank you very much. Uh, I just had a little afterthought. Um, on November 9th, coming up, uh, it's a Wednesday, uh, we're going to be having a uh, lecture about the migratory birds in Cape Florida Park, given by uh, Sue Gold and one of the uh, park personnel. Uh, this should be a very interesting lecture. It'll be in the council chambers, and it's free. <laughs> and it, it will also be on Channel 77. So uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. It's a wonderful thank you. Day.